Second, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We are uh, positively headed north of the border through Breezewood. Lucas and I will be doing all things stellars at the Confluence this weekend. Uh, of course, before we leave, we're going to be having a crab cake presented by the Maryland Lottery. It is the Maryland Crab Cake Tour. We're going to be at Pappas in Cockeysville. Been a long time coming to get up there to Cranbrook Road. We're going to be joined by former Oriole Mike Bordick. It's been a long time since I had a baseball conversation. Um, I keep some baseball company. Luke and I were uh, hammering at each other about Ryan Mountcastle's fame or lack thereof at the baseball or some football game the other night. This guy covers baseball, although I sort of know him through Soccer in the Baltimore Blast a million years ago, and football through Brian Baldinger. He uh, he is a South Philadelphia guy. I don't know. Look, we're from Baltimore. We don't like Philly or Pittsburgh, so you move from one to the other, it's fine. Why? He is a Philadelphian why? living in Pittsburgh because it says Pennsylvania on it. Why, why, why do you think? Robbie H. Bukowski covers all things Pittsburgh Pirates and has warned me, I don't cover the Steelers. I just live amongst them. Uh, as a uh, recovering Eagles fan, how's that working out for you, Rob? You know what? It's actually pretty cool, Ness. <clears throat> it's first of all, you never age. Number one, it's it's pretty impressive. I don't you see know my how hair I... when I let it out, dude. It's like it's it's crazy. I got like, lots of hair. There you look, go. I even I'm, I'm letting it out for you, old school. school. There you go. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, you know, it, it's it's cool because the Steelers bring a level of passion very similar to what the Eagles bring. You know, I grew up an Eagles fan. I was a ball boy and a trainer for the Eagles in my younger years. What years up. was that? What year were you a ball boy? Who were the coaches? So I used to sneak in. So it was Buddy Ryan. Oh, see, I was in section 721, row one, seat nine and 10. I had season books there in the late 80s. So, yeah, yeah. I was there for all So I used, to sneak, I used to sneak in the practice because I grew up right in South Philly, right by the old vet stadium about, you know, I don't know, a quarter, half mile away. And um, we used to sneak in all the time to see practice because there was a little hole in the practice field, like at the end of the gate in the practice field. Uh, right across from where I went to grade school. So we used to sneak under there and I used to shake hands with like Reggie White and Clyde Simmons, Seth Joyner, Andre Waters, Jerome Brown, all those guys. And it was super cool. And I kind of worked my way in and became a ball boy from there. Um, but there's always been a great passion for Eagles, you know, football in Philadelphia, obviously. And then you come over to Pittsburgh, man. It's like, it's like on a, a whole other level uh, out here. And it's pretty cool. Um, you know, they're going a little, you know, they're going a little nuts right now with the way things went on a Sunday in Cincinnati for them. But uh, we didn't like losing to the Bengals either. Cool, we man. did that last month. Yeah. 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 Well, they did it twice this year. So, yeah, I mean, I love the Steelers. I mean, I watch them. I follow them. And, I, you know, I become a fan of the Steelers living in Pittsburgh. So I just don't cover them. Like, I don't know what the day to day is like, you know, with them. Dude, and I you're know picking my... up the accent. Has anybody told you that? I am definitely not picking up the accent. You that are. Is, you is. just you just said living amongst the Stellars. You said something that was very Pittsburgh, and I'm you like, are, no. I knew you was. You are, you are fake news, Nestor. Just so you know, I do not have any accent that shows either South Philly or Pittsburgh. I'm or don't Minnesota. Have either no Minnesota. You didn't bring that with you. No, no, no. I was only there for four years. That that definitely <laughs> didn't pick up anything there. How long have you been in Pittsburgh now? Actually, today is nine years to the day. As a matter of fact. So, like, you arrived when they were good. You were you arrived when, like, McCutcheon was being McCutcheon, right? Yeah. So, my first year covering the Pirates was 2013, the year they broke the streak. Andrew McCutcheon won the MVP that year, uh, which was the first of three playoff runs. And, unfortunately, got short-circuited in 2013 by Adam Wainwright in Game 5 of the, of the NLDS. And then in 2014, by arguably, I mean uh, – maybe the greatest run playoff greatest playoff run ever by a pitcher, Madison Bumgarner pitched that shutout in the wild card game. And then 2015, Jake Arrieta did the same exact thing. Uh, they pitched shutouts in the wild card game back to back years in 14 and 15. So See, I knew uh, sooner or later, you're going to say something pissed me off about the Orioles. You just said two words, Jake and Arietta. Those are, and well, right yeah. now we could say Kevin and Gosman, given all the money he got last week. Right. So, yeah. Well, that's a couple teams removed, but yeah, but, um, but yeah, yeah. Um, we screwed him up first. Yeah, Jake. Isn't that unbelievable? Was that Jake Arrieta and Pedro Strope, right? Wasn't that what it was? Uh, oh, oh, and I'm drawing a blank on the other name, but yeah. Yeah, I remember That's Strope up. screwing things up for us at Yankee Stadium in Game Five uh, back in the day too. Uh, we we don't have that. a lot of baseball postseason memories around here that predate like like puberty for me, like literally. Right. So when you say Pirates, well, I fuck, hate the Pirates because it's well, fuck, but, well, I know, 79, I get all that. That's, hey, look, dude, awesome. did I tell Bert Blylevin that I hated him in front of you? Did I not? You did, you did. Bert, right. Bert, I love Bert, 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 but, you know, Bert, but he wanted no, me to Bert, touch his ring and all, like, yeah. 
Come on, man. I'm from Baltimore. We don't no, you know, it, it carries a lot of memories here because a lot of people, I mean, those Orioles teams are really good. You know, I mean, come on, 83. I mean, 83 Orioles. You got, you know, there, there were there were a lot of good Orioles teams, you know. Well, the forgotten the Orioles teams are the 80. They, they won 100 games in 80 and didn't make the playoffs. They won the most games during the strike season of 81 and didn't make the playoffs at all. They finished really second did. place in the first half and second place in the second half. So, like, it was only 40 years ago. I, I, I'd like to say I'm over it, but, uh, you know, on the baseball side, the Pittsburgh Baltimore stories are sort of really, really similar it's in the, both similar. their arcs. Right? And they were, and the Orioles were good with Buck, what, 2014, 13, 14. I mean, they, they had a couple of good years with Buck, right? I mean, yeah, absolutely. They had playoffs, Adam Jones and JJ Hardy. I mean, it's some pretty good runs, you know, with Brian Roberts, pretty good teams there. But yeah, uh, you know what? The passion is amazing, man. The passion is like that in Baltimore. I mean, I spent a couple of years. I mean, I did soccer with the Baltimore Blast, and even that was cool. They won both years. I worked there in 04, uh, 03 and 04. I was in Milwaukee. I saw Ed Hale last week, and I reminded him that I was there at the Bradley Center. The Bradley Center, no more. They're playing in that that big thing in Milwaukee I'm now. Sure for right? me, yeah. What's Ed Hale doing now? Still owning banks, right? Still runs. Ed is still Walmart. man about town, running the blast. I ran into him at Costas. I'm, I'm wearing my Costas shirt underneath my uh, my Chicken Palooza shirt because we're going to be at Costas on the 15th, celebrating 30 years on radio, Robbie. 30 years That's on amazing. December 13th, man. Don't you have like a 30-year-old son by now? Holy my smoke. son's 37, and he's at Atlantis doing the Lazy wow. River today. Yeah, my son's 37, man. so yes. That's unbelievable, man. Dude, I, I know I still look 12, but I feel 150, and some of these are these trips up to Pittsburgh, and some of it is baseball, right? Like, so, look, I'll talk steel. I had Ed Bouchette on. I'm, I'm going to be up in Pittsburgh all week, and we'll be talking. Yep. I had Will Graves on from the AP, some of my buddies talking yep. Steelers. Give me a little baseball perspective from the inside for you. I mean, you work in the industry. You're around it. I, I, dude, yeah. if there's anything – and you gave me a little bit of ish before we came on the air about Angelos and I fighting. I'll be honest with you. It's been it's been my 16th year being banned. Um, I, You know, I, I did the walkout in 06. So this is going on – How long ago you did that? Holy 16 smoke. years. 16 That's years ago, I did the walkout, okay? So, you know, Peter's eating pudding right now, wherever he is. John's going to move the team to Nashville, or he's not. And, you know, like, all of the we have a, we have a two-year lease here, a two-year mini lease at Camden Yards. So that's where baseball is, but from everyone I talked to, and I had Mari Brown on last week, I've had Eric Fisher on, the people that really know what's going on, this labor yeah. thing's ugly with baseball, right? And, and I'm removed. I mean, I, I look, I read Lords of the Realm back in the 90s when you were a kid, and 30 years of radio, the first five years was all about the, you know, the animosity between Donald Fear and Bud Selig and them firing the commissioner and who's going to negotiate and all that. I'm out of the baseball labor wars, but apparently they're worse than they've ever been. Yeah, I, I got to be completely uh, honest with you and say I only know what I read. Uh, it's very hard to – I mean the two – you would think the two main issues with one and one A being you know revenue sharing and – service time manipulate manipulation, I would think would be the two biggest things that I think, you know, the players want to take care of, you know, obviously when, look, it always comes down to money, every labor negotiation ever in the history of sports, it's always about the money. So <clears throat> uh, the other thing too, that I, I think major league baseball really wants to address is the pace of play issue, you know, in terms of keeping younger generations of fans. I mean, baseball is a timeless game and that's what makes it beautiful. But, you know, Rob Manfred talking about eliminating the runner on second and extra innings. I mean, sometimes, that's what keeps, you know, a three hour and 15 minute game going four hours and 15 minutes or four and a half hours, you know, and you're talking about a night in April and May and early June and September when people have school, kids have school and parents have work, that kind of thing. I mean, you know, they want to get to the ballpark, have a game start at 630 or seven, and then they want to be home by 10, you know, if possible. So I think that's, you know, the, the on field competitive issues in terms of shifting and um, you know, pace but of getting play. a buy-in from the players but, or anybody in regard to any right. of this strategy stuff is really difficult, man. It's very hard. Um, I mean, I think with, with anything, I mean, you look at any labor dispute over the years in any sport. I mean, look at the NHL in 2012, 2013. You look at, uh, you know, the NFL back in, you know, what, 87 was their last one. They had, the, what, the lockout in 2011, I think it was. But, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's unbelievable, you know, when you talk about the distance and, and, and the one thing I will say is being around players is that these players, I think for many, many years and many decades, Ness, there was a, um, a presumption that these guys are just athletes. 
And these guys today are anything but. They're extremely smart. They're involved. They're educated. They know exactly what's going on in terms of the labor disputes. You talk to any player rep, and I've, I, I've been able to have a pretty decent relationship with a lot of the Pirates reps. So it was Jamison Tyone, uh, Tony Watts, and Jacob Stallings, who was just traded to the Miami Marlins, uh, Garrett Cole, um, you know, Jared Hughes, a former relief pitcher who's now retired. You know, all these guys are involved. They're very involved. They know what the issues are. They know how to go about uh, at least what their plan is and what they want to present to the owners. So the owners are not dealing with guys who are just represented by one guy, Donald Fear, or not Donald Fear, it's uh, uh, Tony Clark now. But, you know, it was Donald Fear for a long time, or it was Donald Fear for a bit, Tony Clark, you know. <clears throat> and Marvin guys, Miller before that. <laughs> Mar well, yeah, Marvin set the standard, obviously. But, but when you look at what these players are, they're as involved as they've ever been. And, and they know exactly what these issue are, issues are. And they have a real solid plan in place to present to the owners. And hopefully they come to agreement. Listen, a lockout on December 1st, let's be realistic. It, it, just get it figured out before February. Whatever it is, just get it figured out. Don't, miss, don't get spring training delayed. Don't miss any games. Don't turn off any fans because when millionaires fight billionaires, it never looks good. Well, so They fought a year and a half ago in the middle of the plague about whether they really wanted uh, to play or not, right? Literally. Right. Right. I mean, it falls on deaf ears when you're talking to, you know, the average fan out there, you know, spending their money to go watch these guys play. So I think honestly, and this is just my personal opinion, I have no information. I haven't talked to anybody. I have no idea what's going on with the talks. I just think both sides are educated enough to know that they have way too much to lose to let this thing linger on too long. So if they lock out tomorrow, quite honestly, does it matter? No, it doesn't. It doesn't matter on December 1st. It doesn't matter on January 1st, but you get in the, latter stages of January, then, you know, you got to get it figured out. Well, they better not screw up your trip to Bradenton. I'll tell you that. Robbie Imchikowski joining us here for all things Pittsburgh and baseball and the conversations. Um, maybe your company was it, it changed a couple times, right? Get yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, uh, yeah. So it was FSM Pittsburgh before I got there. When I got there, it was Root Sports. Um, and now uh, we are called AT&T Sportsnet. And we're also undergoing another merger. So we'll see if the uh, – Name of the network changes in the next year. I don't want to call you Root or at t any of that stuff. Um, hey, Robbie's, come, network, man. Robbie's been a friend of mine for going on two and a half decades with, through Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, time in Minnesota and all that. And you're in Pittsburgh, so I reached you this week. And, I, you know, it's not even a Steelers issue or sports issue, but the baseball side of this and the argument that I've had, and I've been through the wars with this. I remember my dad canceled the sporting news back in 1981 because he was pissed <laughs> at baseball, you know. So I go back a long way on this. My, my vibe on this was that the players were always way dug in. And I go back to knowing Mark Belanger, the late great. I mean, players were nasty, ready to fight, ready to yeah. go to war, re ready to walk off the job in the 90s and tell Jerry Reinsdorf to, you know, to get screwed, all of that. Right. I don't know the modern fight. You know, the, the players in this, whether yeah, in the old days it was Steinbrenner that. and Angelos and yeah, Reinsdorf, I, some of that is now a corporation in, that owns half of Canada, that, that right. owns the Blue Jays. You know, I, I don't know where the fight is, but the fight was always in the players being incredibly resilient after Kurt Flood. You know, that, that was – that was sort of the original sin that through the no. 70s and 80s and 90s, the players were taking no ish from the owners at all and, and willing to say, we're not going to play. I don't know where Adley Rutschman is on that or where John Means is or where any of these young players are or even right. the Max Scherzers or the, the older guys who've already got a couple hundred million dollars in the bank. So guys in their 30s have well, already made their bank. You, you How mean, much they want to hold out when they're making $20 million to not go play is well, a different level than in the 80s. 80s, I would say. Yes. And, and, and when you look at the top tier, look, Garrett Cole, Max Scherzer, I mean, you know, Mike Trout, I mean, there are guys, the guys that have hundreds of million dollar contracts and like a Max Scherzer's made 200 some odd million already in his career. Garrett Cole signed for 324 million. Um, <clears throat> that's not, these guys want to set a standard. When you look at Max Scherzer signed for 130 million over three years, an average of $43.3 million a year. Max Scherzer could not make another dime and he could take care of the next 20 generations of Scherzers in his family, number one. Um, but the main reason he does it is to set the bar for those who come after him. So there's a sense of brotherhood within that union that they have the 
uh, obligation to sign for as much as they can to make it better for the next generation. True story, that's dude. That's the main true, reason why they're doing story. it. But, Honest to God, Tom Glavin pulled me up at an all-star game 20 years ago and read mm. me the riot act for Messina signing short with Angelos. Now, this was before he left with the Yankees, but 96, a 97, 98. A, a short-term deal. Messina was a player rep. And, and Glavin was a player rep. And Glavin right. came up to me at the All-Star game and said, what's Messina doing taking less money? He's the best pitcher in baseball. Why is he taking less money from Angelos? And Angelos at that time had a bubby-bubby relationship with, you know, Brady Anderson, Cal. He would take Cal right. out to dinner. He didn't want to negotiate with Ron Shapiro. Like, there was all of that going on where, to your point, players would say, you don't sign short, you know, we're always going to take them to the cleaners and it's responsible for every Scott Boros down the line to clean their clocks. That's how much they hated each other 25 years ago. And right. I'm assuming it's probably up along that when they've told Adley Rutschman, we're not going to turn your clock on. We're going to screw you, screw you, screw you, start your clock whenever we want. Lie might, about we're going to, you know, you bring all the in other players and all that, that the right. young players really get screwed. Well, you look at like, I mean, look at Chris Bryant, perfect example. I mean, Chris Bryant was sent down in 20, what was it 15? I think, you know, he got sent down coming out of spring trainer. Like, dude, this guy's like going to be the best rookie that we've seen in decades. And obviously he was a year later, won the MVP award, helped them win a world series. So you'll look, never get those 500 at bats back. Right. There are cases though, but I mean, look, my hope personally as a fan of the game and as somebody who covers the game, the fans deserve to see the best players on the roster, no matter what, no matter what their contractual, what the free agency, what super two is those kind of things. Dude, the only person who look, everybody does it. And, and it's, it seems to be, it, it appears to be pretty obvious what the motivations are on behalf of the teams. And if you're the teams, why the hell wouldn't you? I mean, it makes perfect sense to, to keep control of the guy as long as you possibly can. Well, then you pitch it like to the fans. The like, did you want to see Rutschman right. up here? You know, we have right. 104 losses instead of 107. Right. Or do you, but Adley, do you, but Adley, do you want but, him playing in 2028 as an Oriole? But, right, but doesn't Adley Rushman get you excited, though, if you're a fan? He was the number one overall pick. The guy's a high prospect in baseball. You got Grayson Rodriguez in double A right now, who's just, you know, a human gas can with the way he's throwing the ball. So, you know, I think you really got to look at, um, you know – I. I just hope this all gets hashed out. Really. I just want to see the whole thing get hashed out in this CBA. So we don't have to deal with this. Like whatever the solution is, I've read that, you know, they want to get the, um, you know, players uh, free agency def uh, by ages or by their wins above replacement stat, whatever it is, just figure it out. Like w both sides, I'm not taking a side either way. Cause I, both sides have a point, but it's like, dude, let's figure this out. Like, let's get this done and not let, don't let the fans suffer because the fan, if, look, people are excited about Adley, Adley Rushman and rightly so. The guy, by all accounts, seems like he's going to be a fantastic player. He's a college catcher. You know, you look at Henry Davis, the Pirates did the same thing. They drafted Henry Davis, number one overall at Louisville. He's getting people excited. The guy's got an elite arm. He's an elite hit tool. He doesn't run fast. What catcher does? I mean, you count on one hand how many catchers actually run fast. So like, you know, I, I can sense a similar excitement that the Baltimore fans have. And Hey, if Adley Rushman is ready in 2022, I have no idea if he is or isn't because I haven't followed him that close, but if he is, he should be there on opening day. He should be your opening day catcher that day. Well, this and speaks to some degree out without regard to service time or free agency or any of that type of stuff. Now, Robbie H. Bukowski's here. He's up in Pittsburgh at at t sports, formerly root and all that stuff. He's doing all things pirates. It, it feels to me like this is one of the inherent problems of the Pirates and the Orioles and the lack of interest in both of our respective towns and ticket sales right on down the line is that this isn't a very fan-friendly sort of setup. And, and, and I'll take it a, a step further with you. I, I was in your stadium when I made a, a discovery about baseball. So it was the weekend that well, Ray, Lewis, well, Ray Lewis went into the Hall of Fame. And we right. had a bus trip out to Canton, Ohio. And right. we went through Pittsburgh. It was in August. Three years ago, whenever it was. I mean, you tell me. 17, 18, 19. They all run together since the plague. And uh, I took five busloads of people out. And on the way back on Sunday, the event was Saturday night. On the way back Sunday, you have to drive through Pittsburgh to get home. Literally, right? Um, you drive a little north and go around Monroeville. Yeah, yeah. And, but, but you have to drive through Pittsburgh to get home. Mm -hmm. I bought tickets for everybody on the trip to go to the Pirates game. They're playing the Cardinals on a Sunday afternoon. 
And I'm like, yeah, stop. Get a Permani. We'll let let the legs out. There are only going to be 10,000 people there. It's not going to be a big – it's not like going to a Steelers game where you got to get it off the island and all that stuff. I had so many complaints. People were like, we don't really want to go to the baseball game. And I'm like, all right, I'll run a special bus back from Canton that you could get on. Turns out three bus loads of people said they wanted to be on the special bus. We only took two buses through Pittsburgh, barely enough 60, 70 people that wanted to go to the game. So I went to the game, and I sat upstairs in the upper deck, and I don't think I saw you that day. I think you may have been off that day. It wasn't the year we went in with Tomlin and did the swabbing. It was like a year or two later. Sunday afternoon, I'm up in right field, um, up in the corner, and I'm looking over the city. It's beautiful. The wind's blowing, the river, the whole deal. Looking down at Point State Park. Yeah, and it's beautiful. one of the most beautiful stadiums, in, if not the most beautiful stadium I'll, from a site you perspective. You take out one of, but go ahead. Yeah, but, but it's fine. I mean, it's a beautiful place. I'm not, so I'm there, and I'm up in the up, upper deck, and I look down. And I'm just watching the game from above. And every person on the field was playing on the right field side of second base. Like, it was yeah. just nine guys on one side of the field, and I looked out on the field, and the whole left side, third base, shortstop, left field's a pasture. And I looked at it at that moment, and I haven't been going to a lot of baseball, right? I mean, I, because of the Orioles, and I did every ballpark in 15, and the Orioles have stunk since then, and I just, I don't go to a lot of baseball games. But watching it on TV, you sort of lose that a little bit. You know, you see the shift or whatever. But seeing it in the stadium that moment, I'm like, I don't even recognize this. It was it was like this seminal moment in my baseball dumb four years ago where, like, I didn't recognize it anymore. And I think to myself, the more I watch it and the more I see Chris Davis go out year after year and hit 150 and can't, you know, has to pull the ball, cannot take the ball the other way. And so many of the players bunting, hit and run, all of this strategy stuff. The games change, man. I mean, it's just like the the baseball you watch every night because my team stinks and I don't watch it. When I do watch it, it feels a little foreign to me. It really does. And it's not nearly as interesting as it used to be as a guy that just sits down. We're like, hockey's still hockey. Even football, even they don't take each other's heads off, it's still football. Baseball's a different game, all of it. I mean, just the way it's played, the way it's taught, these starting pitchers leaving in the first inning. It's just – it's a little goofy when you fly in from above. Well, it might change. Um, you know, they're talking about possibly restricting the shift as part of the next CBA. And I, I don't know. Well, that, that would I'd just be... screw up every general manager in the league because they all live their life by all of these analytical Well, principles, Oh, right? yeah, it certainly trended that way for sure. Yeah, there's a lot of young GMs with analytical backgrounds who, you know, are not. Oh, well, they know. Yeah. They don't know so, field for the game because they never played the game. Right. So it's a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Look, it's hard to argue against what you're saying in terms of the shift because it does take away offense. It takes away, I'm sure, hitters would be ecstatic to see the shift removed or at least where where defensive positioning players have to have their feet on the infield dirt. You know, at the very least, instead of putting somebody, you know, 30 feet, 30 feet in the right field, you know, and the ball, you know, 70% of the time is hit to them and, you know, maybe two, one or two out of every 10, they'll, you know, knock one five feet the other way and you know i don't see as many great plays because the ball winds up going right at someone kind of sort of you know and the analytics absolutely work there's no question about it analytics have a place but that being said what's the next evolution of the game so we'll see i I can't argue against what you're saying and i think a lot of people you know i think a lot of people would like to see the shift ban because there are a lot of purists out there people like yourself they don't like the runner on second i'm not a purist i i just not like purist, entertaining I just like see something entertaining baseball. that's all without the numbers dictating what happens in a game like it like it, letting a computer uh dictate decisions as opposed to a manager's eyeballs or a hitting coach's eyeballs or you know that kind of thing you know just the human element and keeping the human element more involved in the game well, Buck, Buck, Buck managed that way. I mean, that was Buck's th- – that was the magic of him. Yeah. Since this other guy came here, they lose 100 games a year, but he's doing everything, but, you know, the way the Blackjack book says do it. Robbie H. Bukowski's here. I'm going to let you go because I know you you got lots of things going on up there in Pittsburgh. I know it's off season for you. Dude, I hope you get to Bradenton. I hope you get an early yeah, 10 in early February. Too. I want to get to Ed Smith Stadium, one of my favorite places in Sarasota. You love Ed Smith, do you? I like it. I like going there, man. They got the old school bat set up hanging from the – you know, the bad chandelier hanging from the top when you go in. It's, yeah, I That's love it. That's Janet think, Marie, man. You t- tell the Pirates to hire Janet Marie and she'll fix stuff, you know. She I think it's the a great Dodgers. place. It's a great place and I love going there. Well, I love 
spring training as well. I like it out in Arizona because I don't have to drive as much. There will be yep. some spring training. There will be some baseball. Hopefully the Pirates and the Orioles play in another World Series at some time in our lifetime. I really do hope I, so. I, I would love to see the day, and uh, we're going to be there next year, and I love Camden Yards. It's a great place, a great city. I have a great history and a great fondness. For the city of Baltimore, Ness. I love that place, man. All right. And you know how I have a great hatred and disdain and uh, you know for Pittsburgh. But I, mean, I, I wrote down the word for you, okay? You what said this in the last time. You said you're not getting a Pittsburgh accent. Dude, All right. What is it? Dude, you are, you said dollars. Do- dollars like you're from <laughs> Don Pond. Yin's and not. So you dollars. said dollars. You, you said that, that baseball's fighting over dollars. So, uh, hey, and by the way, if, uh, you know – have a, have a good time at spring training. Give some love to the Pirates and all that stuff. But oh, you man. and I are going to get a Permani and a cheesesteak before it's all over with. I at hope some point, we're going to get weekend. the same room at the same time, man. Yes, I hope to see you this weekend, my man. Steelers-Ravens, baby. Nothing like it. Really? Well, you're, if you're at the game, I, I'd love to sit with you and watch Steelers-Ravens. That'd be a lot I, I, I of fun. I, I love it, man. I, I love Steelers-Ravens. It's going to be a great game. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> excuse me, I'm arranging my schedule to uh around that game so i could so i could watch yeah, it you become such a steelers fan you're picking up the accent i'm telling baldinger that's it man He's oh. gonna, they're, not, they're not gonna let you back into philly they're not gonna let you west of like villanova you keep my that big up. brother my big brother in the business <laughs> will be disappointed hey man i appreciate you be well all right Yes, you're the man. Thanks, buddy. Robbie H. Bukowski covers all things pirates in the burg of Pittsburgh. Luke and I are headed up the mountain. It's all brought to you by our friends at Royal Farms, real fresh, real fast. Uh, Luke is out in Owings Mills. Any breaking news happens first on the WNST Tech Service. That's all brought to you by our friends at Coons Ford Security Boulevard. Dennis will be here from 3 until 5, driving you home, as well as Sunday morning. And on Friday, the Maryland Crab Cake Tour comes to Pappas in Cockeysville, joined by baseball player Mike Bordick. I'm sure we'll be talking some shift with Bordy as well. Uh, and then next week we're going to be at the Beaumont on the 8th of uh, excuse me the 9th of December that's Thursday with Don Moeller celebrating my 30th anniversary and then on the 15th we take it to Costas that's my other shirt I got props everywhere man I got my co- see Costas has this is has Steelers colors but it's also Towson and UMBC colors so we find that perfectly acceptable around here I am Nestor we are WNST AM 1570 Towson Baltimore we're never getting our hair cut and we're never stopping talking Baltimore positive <laughs>